story. Hey there. Welcome to episode 11 of Tell Me a True Crime Story. I'm your host, Holly. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you and your family are happy, healthy, and safe. And I also hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope that you ate way too much and You surrounded yourself with people that you really love and that make you happy. In episode 10, the last episode, Those Who Were Killed While Jogging, I brought you the super tragic and heartbreaking case of Karina Vetrano out of Queens in New York City. It's sad to say that there are many more stories that I can recount for you of those who were killed while jogging but we're going to take a break from that topic for now. Today, I have a story for you that is really going to make you so very pissed off that humans can be so evil and so heartless to other humans. This is another one of those cases that has stuck with me ever since I first heard it many years ago, and it's one that doesn't seem to be covered that much. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends and family about it. Follow the podcast on social media. Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok are at Tell Me a True Crime Story, and Twitter is at Tell Me a TCS Pod. Also, please check out my other podcast, All Available Units Respond. So far, there are three episodes on there. Thank you again for being here, and big hugs to all of you. Now, let me tell you a true crime story. Our case today takes place in Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville is in eastern Tennessee and is in Knox County. It is situated at the crossroads of three major interstates, I-75, I-40, and I-81. The University of Tennessee is located in Knoxville and has over 27,000 students. The population of the city of Knoxville in 2007, when our story takes place, was about 177,000. Because I'm a parent of two girls in their 20s and a teenage son, I thought as I researched and wrote about this case, how does a parent go on when they lose a child in a savage, horrific, brutal, barbaric, torturous way. Knowing that your child, your life, your baby suffered such terror and such mental and physical anguish in the hours and moments before their death, I just do not even know. I guess you just exist after that. You don't really live. It's hard to imagine that there can ever be true happiness ever again for a parent after losing a child that way. The torture and abuse suffered by our victims in this story was so wicked, savage, and cruel It's unbelievable and unimaginable. The victims in this case were not leading high-risk lifestyles. They were truly innocent. It's actually a frightful case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't always give disclaimers before my episodes because just by the very nature of this being a true crime podcast, People listening would assume the types of things that they're going to hear. However, to forewarn you, this case is particularly gruesome. 
Remember, you cannot unhear certain things once you've heard them. And details in this case may surely haunt you. And definitely, definitely do not listen to this in the presence of children. Shannon Gale Christian was born on Monday, April 29, 1985, in Nacogdoches, Texas, to her parents, Gary and Dina. Dina was told she'd never have children, but she had two. Shannon had an older brother named Chase. When Shannon was a young girl, the family relocated from Nacogdoches, Texas, to West Knoxville, Tennessee. Shannon loved to golf just like her mom, dad, and brother. Her mom, Dina, said that Shannon was more than a daughter to her. She was her best friend. They'd sit and talk for hours about things that mothers and daughters talk about. Shannon had her future all planned out. She wanted a big wedding and four children. She wanted the firstborn to be a boy so he could be the big brother to his siblings. Shannon was a member of West Park Baptist Church. She graduated from Farragut High School in 2003, and at the time of her murder, she was a senior majoring in sociology at the University of Tennessee. Hugh Christopher Newsom Jr., who went by Chris, was born to Hugh and Mary on Wednesday, September 21, 1983, in a Knoxville hospital. He grew up in the Halls community of Knoxville. His parents were a little older, and they already had grown children when Chris came along. Chris's siblings were Dennis, Debbie, and Andrea. His parents said he really enjoyed life. He played golf and tennis, and he liked fishing. He played baseball his entire life and was a very talented player. He first picked up a baseball bat at just four years old. Chris graduated from Halls High School in 2002. He had been training to be a motorcycle mechanic, but instead he decided to become a trim carpenter. According to his parents, he made his own headboard and made artistic wood creations with his hands. He was a real craftsman. A couple of weeks before his death, he'd sold his motorcycle When his mom asked him why he'd sold it, he said he wanted to live, I guess implying that the motorcycle was dangerous. After his murder, his parents were told many heartwarming stories of Chris's kindness by numerous people. For instance, how one time he'd sat with a lonely girl in the lunchroom who'd been ostracized by other kids and how he'd taken a dateless homecoming queen to the dance. One time Chris had even lulled a snarling pit bull that he'd encountered at a job site. 21-year-old Shannon Christian and 23-year-old Chris Newsom both still lived with their parents. They'd been dating for a couple of months since November of 2006, and they'd met through mutual friends. Chris had recently introduced Shannon to his parents. On the evening of Saturday, January 6, 2007, they had planned to go to dinner together, then to a friend's party in the Halls community of Knoxville. On Saturday afternoon, Shannon went to her friend's apartment to get ready. This was at the Washington Ridge Apartments located at 3101 Washington Ridge Way. Shannon put on blue jeans, a camisole, or some people call it a tank top, with a striped sweater over it and hot pink high heels. She was carrying a gray purse. Shannon had long, straight, golden blonde hair past her shoulders with long side-swept bangs. At about 8 p.m., Shannon's friend Kara left to go to the party, and Shannon stayed behind at Kara's apartment to wait on Chris. Meanwhile, at 8.47 p.m., Chris took $100 out of his bank account at an ATM in the Halls community area and dropped his friend Josh off at the party right after that. He said he was going out to eat with Shannon, then they'd be back at the party together. That was at 9 p.m. Earlier that day, Chris had been golfing for most of the day. He'd gone home to change clothes after golfing, and he was now wearing jeans, a blue and white sweater, a baseball cap, and black and silver Nike Shox tennis shoes, size nine and a half. 
it would have taken Chris about 10 minutes to drive from the party where he dropped off his friend to get to where Shannon was waiting for him. Kara called Shannon from the party and said that Chris was on his way to get her. This phone call possibly prompted Shannon to go wait in the parking lot in her 2005 silver Toyota 4Runner for Chris to arrive. I say this because, according to reports, Shannon was sitting in the driver's side of her 4Runner with the door open, and Chris was standing in her open door, and they were kissing and hugging when the unthinkable happened. 34-year-old Eric Boyd was driving a white Pontiac Sunbird he'd borrowed from his cousin. He drove by Shannon's 4Runner, where Shannon and Chris were. In the Sunbird with him were 25-year-old LaMarcus Davidson, nicknamed Slim, LaMarcus Davidson's half-brother, 24-year-old Latalvis Cobbins, nicknamed Rome, and 23-year-old George Thomas. LaMarcus Davidson had recently been paroled from prison for a carjacking conviction and did not have a car or a job. The men pulled out guns and pointed them at Shannon and Chris. They wanted Shannon's vehicle. This was a carjacking. But then, oncoming headlights appeared and spooked the bad guys. So instead of just taking the forerunner, they forced Shannon and Chris into the vehicle at gunpoint and took off with them. The carjacking had terrifyingly turned into a kidnapping. It all happened so quickly in a flash. They were totally taken by surprise and had no time to react. The four men took Shannon and Chris to a tiny rented home where LaMarcus Davison lived, located at 2316 Chipman Street in East Knoxville. At the house was Vanessa Coleman, the 18-year-old girlfriend of Latalvis Cobbins. Sometime around New Year's, about a week or so earlier, LaMarcus Davidson's half-brother, Latalvis Cobbins, Latalvis Cobbins' girlfriend, Vanessa Coleman, and Latalvis Cobbins' friend, George Thomas, had arrived from Kentucky to stay at LaMarcus Davidson's house. Reportedly, LaMarcus Davidson's girlfriend, Daphne Sutton, didn't like all of them being there, so she'd moved out of the Chipman Street house a couple of days earlier. No one will ever know the exact sequence of the horrifying events that took place in that house over the next two days, but the autopsies of Shannon and Chris tell the story of what happened to them. This is what Chris's autopsy and the investigation revealed. His stomach was empty. He hadn't eaten in the hours before his death. He did not have any defensive wounds. I presume that he didn't have any defensive wounds because he and Shannon had been held at gunpoint during their horrific ordeal, and they had also been bound. Chris had significant injuries to his anal and genital area. He had lacerations, tearing and bruising around his anus. He was anally penetrated one to two hours before his death. There was semen inside of him. He'd also been penetrated with an object. Chris was shot three times with a small caliber bullet. All three bullets were still lodged in his body. One bullet entered his body between the back of his neck and his shoulder. It was fired at least two to three feet away. A second shot was to his lower back. This bullet traveled steeply upward, which indicated that he was bent over when the gun was fired. That shot severely damaged his spinal cord. The last shot was fired with the muzzle of the gun held against his head, above his right ear. This fatal shot severed his brain stem and caused instantaneous death. Chris had a hematoma on the right side of his forehead. This indicated that he'd either been struck with something or that he fell and hit his head on the ground. This injury could have happened when he was shot while bending over. Chris only had on a t-shirt, a shirt, and underwear. His feet were muddy. 
He'd been made to walk barefoot to the area by the railroad tracks where he was executed. Lamarcus Davidson was later seen wearing Chris's Nike tennis shoes, which were too small for Lamarcus's feet. Chris's head was wrapped in a gray hoodie, a blue bandana was tied over his eyes, an ankle sock was rolled up, shoved in his mouth, and held in place with a shoelace. His own belt and some flowery fabric were wrapped around his ankles. A shoelace and some nylon were securing his wrists together, which were behind his back. He was found laying on his back. His body was wrapped in a comforter, and he was set on fire using an accelerant. Gasoline was present in soil samples that were taken where his body was found. Although his head, face, and upper body were burned the most severely, the high temperature of the fire also destroyed the DNA in the semen that was found inside of him. Shannon's autopsy and the subsequent investigation tell the heartbreaking story of her final hours of literal hell. Her stomach was empty too, just like Chris's had been, and just like Chris, she did not have any defensive wounds. She suffered a prolonged attack over the course of many hours. She was brutally raped orally, vaginally, and anally by more than one assailant and with great force. She was forced to perform oral sex. In and around her mouth was injured and bruised. Her frenulum, which is the thin piece of skin that connects the upper lip to the gums, was torn. Her vaginal and anal areas were gravely injured. The medical examiner explained that some object must have come into contact with her genital area in order to cause such severe injuries, possibly from being kicked in the vaginal area. Shannon had carpet burns on her butt and lower back and bruising to her shoulders and back of her arms. She had extensive hemorrhages under her scalp from being beaten about the head and had a cut on her hand. When her body was recovered, she was naked from the waist down and was wearing only a camisole and a sweater. A chlorine substance was found on Shannon's camisole. A cleaning liquid containing bleach had been sprayed into her mouth and on her badly damaged genital area, presumably to destroy DNA evidence in the semen that had been deposited in her mouth and body during the forcible oral, vaginal, and anal rape. Through DNA analysis, it was determined later on that Lamarcus Davidson was the contributor of the DNA in sperm found in Shannon's body and on her genes. His half-brother, Latalvis Cobbins, was the contributor of the DNA in sperm found in Shannon's mouth and on her camisole, sweater, and jeans. According to Vanessa Coleman, When she was interrogated by investigators, Lamarcus Davison tried to break Shannon's neck. Shannon collapsed to the floor. Lamarcus Davison ordered Vanessa Coleman to check Shannon to see if she still had a pulse. Vanessa Coleman said she couldn't tell if she had a pulse or not. After all of the hours of agony and suffering that Shannon had endured, her murderers were not done. They put a white plastic bag tightly over her head and knotted it in the back. She was tied up essentially in a compact, compressed ball. Her hands and feet were tied. Part of a sheer curtain was tied around her ankles and wrapped around her neck. She'd been forced into a tight, fetal position. Her thighs were tied with the same floral fabric that had been used to bind Chris. Her thighs were brought up tightly against her chest. Her head, neck, and shoulders were twisted and pressed against her bent knees, with her left cheek pressed tightly against her knee. Shannon was then placed, alive, inside of five trash bags, then put inside of a big black trash can. She was covered with bedding, sheets, and other bags. The lid was then put on the garbage can. Her time of death was estimated to be sometime between Sunday and Monday afternoon. It was later determined through interrogations of the suspects 
that Shannon was probably placed in the garbage can on Sunday, January 7th. She died from mechanical asphyxia and positional asphyxia. In layman's terms, and according to the medical examiner, the oxygen around her face would have been depleted within 10 to 30 minutes after she was put in the garbage can. She would have died within three to five minutes after that. Because she could not breathe with the plastic bag over her head and because of her positioning in the confined space, Shannon suffocated to death. 21-year-old Shannon died with her eyes open. When Shannon and Chris never showed up at the party, their friends became very concerned. They tried calling and texting Shannon and Chris but got no answer and got no reply. At around 11 p.m., a couple of Chris's friends went by the Washington Ridge apartment complex and saw his truck in the parking lot, but Shannon's forerunner was gone. Several hours later, at 3.30 a.m., Shannon's friend returned to her apartment from the party. She saw Chris's truck in the parking lot, and Shannon's vehicle was gone. Her apartment door was locked, and Shannon's overnight bag was not there. On Sunday, January 7th, in the morning and into the afternoon, Kara and Shannon's mom, Dina, tried repeatedly to reach Shannon on her cell phone, but there was no answer. On Sunday afternoon, the manager of the shoe department, where Shannon worked, called to check on her because she did not show up for work. Shannon's mom called hospitals, Chris's parents, and Shannon's friends to try to find her. No one knew where she was. Shannon's mom filed a missing persons report with the Knox County Sheriff's Office. Chris's parents were worried too, and ended up doing the same thing. On Sunday morning, January 7th, at about 7.45 a.m., a railroad employee of a nearby railroad saw smoke by the tracks. Almost five hours later, at 12.24 p.m., the Knoxville City Police Department received a report from a Norfolk Southern Railroad train engineer that he'd seen a body by the railroad track. At 12.55 p.m., authorities located the body by the tracks near the Chipman Street house. That body would later be identified as 23-year-old Chris Newsom. Although Shannon and Chris were missing, the police would not search for them because they were considered adults. The parents were told they'd have to do it themselves, which they did. Shannon's parents contacted their cell phone provider, who told them that Shannon's cell phone had last pinged off of a cell phone tower on Cherry Street. That night, Shannon and Chris's friends and family went to that area to search for them street by street. They did end up locating Shannon's vehicle hours later in the very early morning of Monday, January 8th. It was found at the corner of Chipman Street and Glider Avenue between 1.30 and 2 a.m. Stickers that Shannon had on the back window had been removed from the forerunner. The police were contacted and responded to the scene. Several of Shannon's belongings were missing from her car which included bags of clothing that she'd planned to donate and her overnight bag. It was later determined that LaMarcus Davidson had given many of Shannon's belongings to his ex-girlfriend, Daphne Sutton. The front seats of the forerunner were pushed all the way back. The back floorboard was caked with mud. A crumpled up pack of Newport cigarettes was in the back, but neither Shannon nor Chris smoked Newport cigarettes. The vehicle was photographed and fingerprinted at the scene. There were no fingerprints on the outside of the forerunner. It appeared to have been wiped down. Sandra Bible, who lived in a house at the corner of Chipman Street and Glider Avenue, said the vehicle had not been there at midnight when she was on her porch smoking a cigarette. She also told police she'd never seen the forerunner in the neighborhood before. The families of Shannon and Chris requested police do a door-to-door search for them, but that request was denied. So the forerunner was recovered shortly after midnight on Monday, January 8th. Some hours later, still the same morning, on the same day, a chaplain accompanied by investigators went to inform Chris's parents, Hugh and Mary Newsom, that his body had been identified as the burned body found by the railroad tracks near Chipman Street. Mary Newsom collapsed. 
Now, a quick side note that I wanted to mention about the fingerprinting process of the Forerunner when it was found. I don't usually go into my opinions too much on these cases. I just stick to the facts of the case and present them to you. However, I felt it necessary to point this out to you guys because otherwise you probably wouldn't catch it just by listening. When I'm researching these cases, I'm going by the court documents. I'm studying the timeline and details of the case. It's all there in black and white. Still, things are not plainly stated. You have to put the pieces together. So in putting the pieces together, this is what I gleaned. It was late on the night of Sunday, January 7th, or early on the morning of Monday, January 8th, however you want to put it that senior evidence technician Dan Crenshaw with the Knoxville PD was sent to the scene where the forerunner was found. So this would have been roughly 24 hours after Shannon and Chris were kidnapped. He inventoried, photographed, and fingerprinted the outside of the forerunner. Then, apparently, Dan Crenshaw goes home because his shift is up and the vehicle was towed to the police impound lot. Court documents state that almost 24 hours later, at 11 p.m. on Monday night, Dan Crenshaw returned to work on the night shift, retrieved a bank envelope that was on the back seat of the Forerunner, and began processing it for fingerprints. Now, this really made me angry. Why was there such a big time lapse at all in the processing of this vehicle? Two kids are missing. Their parents who know their kids say their kids did not just take off and you wait that long to process the whole entire vehicle and all of its contents. As all of us who follow true crime know, time is of the utmost essence in these cases. If Dan Crenshaw had to go home, someone else should have taken over to complete the forensic processing of the vehicle when it was found. This, to me, is unacceptable and bad police work. Well, lo and behold, a fingerprint was recovered on that bank envelope that was on the back seat of the forerunner. The fingerprint was run through the system, and a few hours later, at 2.45 a.m., the fingerprint was determined to belong to LaMarcus Davidson, whose address was on Chipman Street. At 7 a.m., the fingerprint match was verified and a search warrant for 2316 Chipman Street was signed by Judge Stansberry at 12.53 p.m. on Tuesday, January 9th. Less than an hour later, officers entered the small house on Chipman Street at 1.39 p.m. to execute the search warrant. No one was in the house. Sergeant Keith DeBeau noticed an oddly shaped 32-gallon black plastic trash can in the corner of the kitchen. Because of its odd shape, he thought someone may be hiding in there, and he drew his service weapon. He lifted the lid and saw an arm. He touched it, and he knew it was a dead body. Shannon Christian had finally been found. It was 1.42 p.m. on Tuesday, January 9th, 2007, about two and a half days after she'd been abducted and about two days since she'd been placed in the garbage can. Later that same day, a second affidavit for a search warrant with additional information was prepared and presented to Judge Chuck Cerny. The judge signed off on the search warrant at 7.25 p.m. For five hours, more evidence was collected as a result of this search including many items that belonged to the victims, Shannon and Chris. These items included Shannon's gray purse, her hot pink high heels, her iPod, her camera, her personal toiletry items, her mom's blockbuster video card, a pay stub from her job, and a CD. Two of Chris's baseball caps were found. A gas can and a bottle of bleach-based cleaner was recovered in the kitchen. In their investigation and canvassing of the Chipman Street neighborhood, authorities learned that a Chipman Street resident that had been up watching TV in the early morning hours of Sunday, January 7th, heard, quote, three fairly evenly spaced pops, end quote, coming from the direction of the railroad tracks. 
He said it was about 1.45 a.m. when he heard the pops, which would have been a few hours after Shannon and Chris were kidnapped. What that resident heard was probably Chris being executed by the railroad tracks. All of the suspects were rounded up and arrested within a couple of days following the discovery of Shannon's body on January 9th. This included Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, and Vanessa Coleman, who'd fled back to Kentucky. Eric Boyd was picked up on a federal warrant charged with being an accessory after the fact. He was the only one that never admitted to being at the Chipman Street house when the crimes occurred, and he was the only one of the five perpetrators not charged with murder by the state of Tennessee. He was convicted by a federal jury in 2008 and was sentenced to 18 years in a federal prison. As you can imagine, with a case of this magnitude and with so many perpetrators involved, there were a lot of legal proceedings that occurred over the course of many years, including a big scandal involving the judge that had presided over the trials of defendants LaMarcus Davidson, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, and Vanessa Coleman. In 2011, that judge, criminal court judge Richard Baumgartner, resigned and pleaded guilty to official misconduct. He was addicted to prescription pain pills, oxycodone, hydrocodone, Percocet, Valium, and Xanax. He bought pills during court breaks. The married judge also had sex in his judicial chambers with one of his suppliers named Dina Castleman, who was less than half his age. He even bought drugs from people under his jurisdiction that he'd previously sentenced. Judge John Kerry Blackwood took over ex-judge Richard Bumgardner's docket. Judge Blackwood ordered new trials for four of the defendants in Shannon and Chris's murders, citing, quote-unquote, structural errors due to presiding Judge Bumgardner's drug activities and pill addiction. The defendants were LaMarcus Davison, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, and Vanessa Coleman. Eric Boyd did not receive a new trial because he had been tried in a federal court under a different judge. After much legal wrangling, George Thomas and Vanessa Coleman ended up receiving new trials. The families and friends of Shannon and Chris had long felt justice was denied when it came to Eric Boyd not being charged with murder and other charges like the other four perpetrators. In 2018, one of the perpetrators, George Thomas, secretly struck a deal with state prosecutors to have his sentence reduced in exchange for testifying against Eric Boyd. At Eric Boyd's state trial in 2019, George Thomas testified to the following, which implicated Eric Boyd in the murders of Shannon and Chris. He saw Eric Boyd with the white Pontiac Sunbird. He saw Eric Boyd bringing Shannon and Chris bound and gagged into the house on Chipman Street. He saw Eric Boyd take Chris to the railroad tracks. He saw three flashes from a gun. He saw Eric Boyd get a gas can from the forerunner. Eric Boyd was convicted and sentenced to serve two life sentences back-to-back -back and had another 90 years stacked on top of that for the related crimes of especially aggravated kidnapping, robbery, and rape. Eric Boyd is now 50 years old and is serving his time as Tennessee Department of Corrections inmate number 255762 in medium security custody at Bledsoe County Correctional Complex in Pikeville, Tennessee. Reported ringleader LaMarcus Davidson is now 41 years old. He is Tennessee Department of Corrections inmate number 328954. He is held under maximum security custody at River Bend Maximum Security Institution in Nashville, Tennessee. He was sentenced to die for his atrocious crimes. Latalvis Cobbins, LaMarcus Davidson's half-brother, is now 39 years old. He is Tennessee Department of Corrections inmate number 459699, serving his time under medium supervision at Northwest Correctional Complex in Tiptonville, Tennessee. His sentence is life without parole. George Thomas is now 39 years old. He is Tennessee Department of Corrections inmate number 464319, serving his time in minimum restricted custody at Northwest Correctional Complex in Tiptonville, Tennessee. His sentence is 50 years. His sentence will be up on May 1st, 
2053, at which time he will be 70 years old. Vanessa Coleman, who was Latalvis Cobbins' girlfriend at the time of the slayings, is now 34 years old. She is Tennessee Department of Corrections inmate number 473393, serving her time under minimum restricted supervision at Deborah K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. She was up for parole in 2020. It was denied. She will not have another parole hearing until December of 2030. If she is let out on parole at that time, she will be 42 years old. Her release date is scheduled for April 11, 2035. She will be 46 years old. Shannon Christian is buried in Highland Memorial West Cemetery in Knoxville, Tennessee. Under her name, on her grave marker reads, Our Angel, and under the dates on her marker it reads, Your light will shine forever. In 2009, two years after the murder of her son Chris, his mom Mary spoke to WVLT News in Knoxville and said, I put my arm around the body bag and told him, Chris, I will not say goodbye to you because I know someday I will see you again. That's what I believe and that's what gets me through. Chris was laid to rest on Saturday, January 13, 2007, at Woodhaven Memorial Gardens in Powell, Tennessee. At the top of his grave marker, it reads, Beloved Son, Brother, and Uncle. At the bottom, under his name, it says, Safe at Home. The Halls Community Park holds a baseball tournament in Chris's honor every year. There's an annual motorcycle memorial ride held in Shannon and Chris's honor in which all proceeds raised from the event go to local charities in Knoxville. Waste Connections, a trash collection company, is located right next door to where the murders occurred. In 2008, they purchased the home at 2316 Chipman Street for a little less than $20,000 and then demolished it. A memorial was placed there in memory of Shannon and Chris. Two new laws were approved by the state legislature of Tennessee in 2014. The Shannon Christian Act prevents defendants and their lawyers from portraying crime victims in a negative light in front of a jury. This was in response to claims made in court that Shannon and Chris took drugs. LaMarcus Davidson claimed that Shannon and Chris were not kidnapped, that they went to his house to buy drugs from him. Because of laws already in place at the time that protect the accused and prevent prosecutors from bringing up a defendant's previous crimes in an effort to prejudice a jury, jurors were not allowed to hear about LaMarcus Davidson's prior carjacking conviction. The Chris Newsom Act creates the presumption that a judge acts as the 13th juror following a unanimous verdict. The original presiding judge, Richard Baumgartner, was removed from the bench and resigned before he could affirm the convictions in the initial trials. This triggered a series of legal problems in upholding the convictions of the four defendants tried in his court. The next judge granted George Thomas a new trial because he said he couldn't act as the 13th juror because he had not been there for the testimony linking George Thomas to the murders. Therefore, the Chris Newsom Act allows a new judge on a case to act as a 13th juror when the jury's verdict is unanimous. Victims are never to be blamed, never, ever, and there will always be what-ifs that torment us. What if Shannon had gone to the party with her friend Kara instead of waiting on Chris? What if Shannon hadn't waited in her Toyota 4Runner for Chris and she'd waited inside the apartment instead. What if Chris hadn't stood in the open driver's side door and had just gotten in the passenger seat and they pulled off? What if the perpetrators had come along 10 minutes earlier or 10 minutes later? They probably would have never encountered the innocent couple in the parking lot. What if the car driving through the parking lot of the apartment complex that spooked the perpetrators hadn't come along at all? Maybe they would have just taken Shannon's forerunner and let her and Chris go. Out of all of these five perpetrators, what if just one of them had done the right thing and called the police during the crime? What if just one of them had helped Shannon or Chris escape? The what-ifs can drive us insane, and I'm sure they'd plague the families of Shannon and Chris. There is always something to be learned from every true crime case or story. 
I always remember what Oprah taught us on TV a long time ago. Don't ever let anyone take you to a second location. Over the years, we've heard invaluable information that in a moment of danger could be life-saving. Nothing I heard made a greater impression on me than back in 1991. I think we were beginning our fifth season. And a man named Sanford Strong came on and, and shared this. Never forgot it. Rule number one. And frankly, it's probably, in my opinion, the most important. Never allow them to take you somewhere else. Never. If everyone in this room and everyone watching this program has never drawn the line and made a decision on crime protection, you better make it when they decide to move you from crime scene number one to crime scene number two. Because the crime scene number two is going to be isolated. You won't choose it. You'll be the focus of the crime. I think what was so interesting about that piece of advice is at the time that we all heard that, we had been trained, as women people especially, to believe that you just do whatever they say. Whatever they say, go along with it. And what's important for those of you who are watching right now and those of you who are on the internet with us right now to know is that it's all about using your gut in the moment. And people who've survived horrific circumstances talk about listening to that intuition and every move being made calculated on listening to what your gut says. What the experts now say is do not allow yourself to be taken to the second location because anybody who is trying to harm you wants to get you to an isolated place where they can do that without other people seeing or knowing it. So in that moment of making the decision Oh, you're going to shoot me? If you're going to shoot me, you have to shoot me now rather than shoot me in isolation where nobody can see you. If you are sitting in your car, keep the doors locked. If someone presents a gun and tells you to open the door, unlock the door, or roll down the window, don't do it. Drive away. What they can or are willing to do to you in public is much better than what they will most assuredly do to you once they have you in the second location of their choosing. The second location will be a place where they feel comfortable and where they have complete power and control over you and the situation. It will probably be desolate, far from help, and far from civilization. You will not be able to escape. No one will hear your cries or screams. I repeat, do not let anyone take you to a second location. Fight like hell right there wherever you are. Get loud cause a scene, even if they have a gun or knife held on you. If you cause a ruckus and a commotion, they probably won't risk bringing more attention to themselves by firing their weapon. They will most likely flee and look for an easier target. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends and family about it. Share the podcast or share an episode that you loved. Follow the podcast on social media. Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok are at Tell Me a True Crime Story, and Twitter is at Tell Me a TCS Pod. And please write a review for the podcast and give it five stars. That would help so much to grow our podcast family. Also, please check out my other podcast, All Available Units Respond. The podcast covers interesting stories in detail of disasters and catastrophes like structural collapses, massive fires, train derailments, and plane accidents. If you like true crime, I think you will enjoy the stories on that podcast too. And if you have people in your life that are firefighters, police officers, first responders, or retired from any of those professions, I believe they would like the stories on that podcast. Again, it's called All Available Units Respond, and so far there are three episodes on there. I'll be adding the next episode very soon. Thank you again for being here. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. Tune in next week for episode 12 when I'll tell you another true crime story. Big hugs to all of you. Bye-bye.